everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mario Cabo. I'm with the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I'm going to be giving the presentation in English. Then we're going to have Sergio Mora give a presentation when we're done in Spanish. Sergio is with the uh, International Study Center. And then we also have uh, Virginia Palacios, who's welcoming you here, who helped to, um, to put the uh, Neighbors of Oil and Gas program together. Um, uh, why don't we just go around the room real quick and let everyone introduce themselves and just say who you are and who you're here with, if you're just a member of the community, or um, do you want to go ahead and start? Um, Henry Barco, just here. Can you get this? Carl Walker, I'm the family doctor. Omar Garcia with Steer, the Oil and Gas Trade Association for South Texas. Pete Bell with Shape Ranch. Great. Let's go with Steer, Crazy Springs. I apologize, I started out without the microphone, I'm going to go ahead and grab it. Hello? Can you hear me better now? Good deal. Okay. So first of all, where is the Eaglesford Shale? I'm sure a lot of you from industry are familiar with the entire region, but um, if you live here, you've seen a lot of activity here, but you may not know, be familiar with all of the Eaglesford Shale region. And so you can see it right here. It's, I usually describe it as almost an upside down rainbow underneath San Antonio, but it goes up past College Station and comes down all the way down into Mexico. Um, so for people who are residents of the community here, how close do you all live to uh, oil and gas activity? Is there, do you live within five miles, within a mile? More like 20. More like 20? Okay. Good deal. Um, so why are we here? Well, uh, we want to help you, uh, members of the community, be able to identify potential risks uh, that can occur from time to time when things go wrong. Uh, and learn how to observe them and report them to, when you find those, those any kind of incidents, um, to be able to report them to the proper agencies. And what we'd like to do is be able to help, by doing that, help state agencies respond more effectively. So right here, what you see is a, uh, this is a, a mud and oil sludge spill from an open top truck. You saw a lot of these in the early days of, of the boom here in the Eagleford Shale. And this is something that, you know, first of all, um, people, people started reporting these issues and um, the agencies responded and they started, they, they actually educated the communities to let them know to report people with open top dump trucks, which was illegal to transport this stuff. And so, in doing so, um, the violations were, um, or I guess, people were people were fined for doing that, and you saw less of that in the future. Um, but an issue like this, this is something that's easy to identify. When you have a chemical spill, when you have a liquid spill, a sludge spill, that's something that's easy to identify. But what about when you have a gas leak? If you have a gas leak, that's you know could be an invisible gas. That's that might be much harder to, to identify. Does anybody see a gas leak in this image? So there, there's the same image with an infra, infrared camera. And you can see gas coming out of there. Now, that may be on purpose. Um, you know, there's, some of those uh, tanks are actually designed to, to let off some gases so that there's, so when they build up pressure so that there's not an explosion. At the same time, there could be a hatch that gets stuck open and it could continue to just allow allow those gases to to leak all day long. Um, then, of course, we have uh, flaring in the Eagleford Shale. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with the extent to which flaring occurs in the Eagleford Shale, but uh, the Express News had reported that there were there's 94 billion cubic feet between 2009 and 2014, which equates to enough to heat um, all the homes in San Antonio for three and a half years. 
So, um, but like, how does this compare, let's say, to the rest of the state? Well, in the Eagle Fir, it's uh, actually flaring occurs at 10 times the rate of the rest of the state. And in some counties, it's up to 30% of the usable gas that is burned away. Um, so when you have, um, whether it's, whether you're venting on purpose or whether you have leaks, there are air pollutants that, that can uh, come from these activities and they can affect your health. And there's an equation to determine what your health risk is. And that's determined by, first you look at the hazard. What is the health problem that could be caused by that pollutant? Um, and then you look at how much of that pollutant are you exposed to? So you look at what is, you know, what is the con concentration level of the pollutant that you're exposed to, and over how long of a period of time are you exposed to that? And that's what's going to determine what your actual health risk is. Um, so we have flaring in the Eagle Perch Shale, which I mentioned before. It's better than venting, but there are still some health and environmental concerns from flaring. Um, you can see that there were 15,000 tons of air pollutants from flares in 2012. Um, that's more than all of the oil, more than all the pollutants from all the oil refineries in Corpus Christi combined in that same year. Um, so, what are the health concerns from the flaring and combustion? Um, well, you, you can uh, you get particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides. All those can potentially cause breathing problems or asthma. Um, particular ma particulate matter, in particular. Um, can also affect your heart. It can maybe give you an irregular heartbeat um, or sometimes cause heart attacks. Then there are environmental effects from the flaring combustion. Um, there's carbon dioxide, which uh, is going to warm the climate, and it also harms the ocean life by making the oceans more acidic. Um, then there's sulfur dioxide, which contributes to acid rain, and nitrogen oxides, which are much more potent of greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and it's a precursor to ground level ozone. Um, now hydrogen sulfide is one of the pollutants that the industry takes most seriously. Um, you can recognize it often when you see one of those yellow and black uh, poison gas pipeline signs. It's extremely toxic. It's a colorless gas, so you're not going to see it. Um, it's, it also, if you go back to that slide where I showed you the infrared camera, you're not going to pick it up on those either. Um, but it's, it's heavier than air, and so you're often going to find it on a day that's not very windy in low-lying areas, if it, if it did leak, obviously. Um, and it smells like rotten eggs. However, you may smell rotten eggs and then not smell them later, and that doesn't mean necessarily that it's gone away because it deadens your sense of smell. And so you can inhale some, smell that rotten egg smell, and then lose the ability to smell, and you won't smell that that uh, you may not notice it, its presence anymore. Um, so how do you identify hydrogen sulfide? Well, um, you can look at the flags that are on an oil and gas site. And so if you see a white flag on a site, that means that presence of hydrogen sulfide has not been found there. Um, and hydrogen sulfide is, it's, it's a natural um, occurring gas that occurs when, you know, when, when oils, is forming over millions of years without the presence of oxygen, that's when it's going to start to form. And that's why you find it in some areas you're going to find it where there's oil, in some areas you'll find the oil without it. Um, if there's a green flag, then there's a, a low potential or potential low hydrogen sulfide hazard. So it's, it's going to be, if it does leak out, it's going to be in lower concentrations. It could cause irritation of your eyes, nose, throat, and respiratory system. If it's a yellow flag site, then there's a medium hazard. Um, exposure can cause headaches, dizziness, nausea, nausea, coughing, vomiting, difficulty breathing, things that are a little bit more serious. And then a red flag is a high standard, which can cause shock, convulsions, uh, extremely rapid unconsciousness, coma, or death. I actually have a friend who works in the oil and gas industry who went, became unconscious from uh, being in the presence of hydrogen sulfide. So we had to go in and grab him and carry him out of the area. Um, so you, we have uh, intentional venting, and then sometimes there's unintentional leaking of gases. 
uh, when that happens, you can have some, some of the uh, pollutants that you could be exposed to are poly or PAHs, uh, methane, and VOCs. Uh, PAHs can potentially cause cancer, breathing problems, developmental problems. Methane is an explosive hazard. Um, and then the VOCs also can cause cancer over time, irritation of the skin, dizziness, headaches, um, other, other medical issues including vomiting and other health problems. But also remember the, the health risk equation that I talked about earlier. So these are all different symptoms that you can experience um, or effects of some of these pollutants, but just keep in mind that the health risk is determined by what is the actual hazard that is posed by that pollutant, and then what are you, how much of it are you exposed to? What is the concentration level you're exposed to, and for how long are you exposed to it? And that's gonna de determine really what kind of symptoms you may experience uh, from that pollutant. So, a lot of people hear about ozone, and ozone, um, you, you might hear good things about it, you might hear bad things about it. Ozone is good up in the atmosphere. It helps protect us, um, but we don't want it down at ground level. And if you, at, at higher concentrations at ground level, um, then it can cause some, some health problems. And it's formed when nitrogen oxides come in contact with VOCs. Um, so th these are both the byproducts of com the combustion process, and you know it could be um, unintentional leaking or intentional venting. But when they, when those two chemicals uh, come into contact in the presence of sunlight, then they can form ozone. And um, so ozone is something that we monitor. So we, we monitor ozone, and we also monitor the um, the precursors, the nitrogen oxides, and um, and the VOCs. So in the Barnett Shale region, uh, which is up in North Texas near Dallas Fort Worth, they have 31 stations that uh, that monitor the nitrogen oxides and VOCs. Does anybody have any idea how many um, how many air monitors we have in the Eagleford Shale? Other than Peter, no guesses out there. There's 31 in the Barnett Shale. So in the Eagleford Shale, we have five. So I don't know if that surprises any of you, um, because the Eagleford Shale is pretty, pretty significant oil and gas plant. So if you live here in the community, what can you do? Well, uh, we want to encourage you to be able to gather information when you see that when an issue arises, report your concerns, and um, hopefully we will have less incidents in the future. Because our vision is. When people who live around oil and gas development are are informed about what to look for for any kinds of issues that could come up, if they're reporting them, then the state agencies are going to have more information. They'll be able to prioritize which sites they visit, and ideally, in the future, we'll have less less incidents of contamination. Um, how about uh, number of wells per state inspector? Anybody have a guess? how many wells there are uh, per inspector that the TCEQ has or the Railroad Commission. <laughs> I heard too many, okay. Well, <laughs> for TCEQ there are over 850 active wells. That's, that's active wells um, per inspector. And for the Railroad Commission there are over 1,000 active wells uh, per inspector. So, Obviously, the inspectors can't be everywhere at once. You saw the picture of the Eagleford Shale region. You saw how big it is. That's a lot of land to cover. Um, and that's why neighbors can play an important role, by becoming informed, knowing what to look for, and reporting issues as they arise. Um, then there's also a new state law that we want everyone to be aware of. It's Texas House Bill 40. Uh, House Bill 40 has reduced municipal authority to regulate oil and gas. Um, and so it means that state agency and citizen engagement with the agencies is more important than ever. Uh, specifically what House Bill 40 did is it took away the rights for municipalities to regulate oil and gas activity below the surface. And it said if you want to regulate it above the surface, you have to prove that your, um, any of your regulations are still commercially reasonable. And the term commercially reasonable is something that we probably are going to see played out in the courts to find out what exactly that means. Um, so something else you can do is um, baseline water quality 
getting a baseline water quality assessment, and then do follow-up monitoring after. So you want to test your water before there's going to be oil and gas activity. If you know there's going to be new activity near where you live or near where um, you work, um, if you have uh, your own water supply, you can test it before and then do follow-up testing after there's some activity there. Um, it's, it can be expensive, there are, it's also um, not a simple process, and so what we've done is we've included a handout in your folder, and so you can go and you can look at that, and that can help guide you through. It's a little bit more complicated than something I could present in this presentation right now, but, um, and it's also something that we have on our Neighbors Oil and Gas website, so if you want to go there as well, in case you're watching this on a video and you don't have one of these folders. And that's where you can find the information there at the neighbors of oil and gas So how does the reporting process work? Um, what are the agencies that you report different issues to? Well, for water, if your well goes dry, um, that's a water quantity issue. And so you're going to want to report that to your local groundwater conservation district. Um, if there's contamination to your private well, that's something that you would report to the Railroad Commission. But it, and if it's a public water supply that's contaminated, you report it to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So you can see there's, there's, a, there's a lot of details and it's not always simple to figure out and that's why we're here. We want to help you with that process. Um, so what else can the Railroad Commission respond to? Well, they're in charge of venting and flaring at, in terms of uh, giving out permits. Uh, and they, and as far as they, they determine, like that permitting process is determined by uh, how long someone wants to, to flare or vent for, and how much volume they're going to be flaring or venting. Um, they're also they also oversee oil and gas contamination, um, so that's going to be anything in a private water well or any kind of soil contamination from, that's oil and gas related. Um, so. When do they issue permits? Well, they don't issue permits. You don't need a permit if you're going to be venting or flare. If you're going to be venting for less than 24 hours or flaring for less than 10 days um, during a completion or work over the well, um, there, there's volume limits for that as well. For gas wells, 15,000 cubic feet per day, and that's not something that you can really eyeball. Um, or for oil leases, 50,000 cubic feet per day per day. And when they do issue a permit, a flaring permit is going to be issued for 45 days. Um, then you can get extensions on that up to a total four times, so or three three extensions, so a total of 180 days. Um, if you want to be able to flare longer than that, then you have to request a hearing with the railroad commission. Um, and then there are special uh, circumstances in which you can get a permanent ex uh, exemption, and um, that's that's just a more complicated process. Um, but there are factors in there, like uh, how close is the nearest pipeline. Um, you know, and what a cost-benefit analysis, estimate of how much gas you actually have that you're going to be flaring. So uh, we're in Carrizo Springs, so uh, this is, you're in the District 1 office of the Railroad Commission. Here's all the contact information. You're also going to find that contact information in your folder. Uh, there's a 24-hour emergency line. There's a general information line. Uh, but if it's not an emergency, they usually suggest that you just call the local district office. That's where you're probably going to get the fastest service. So let's say you do find an issue and you want to, um, you want to file a complaint. Well, you can do that formally where you use your name and it becomes public or you can do it anonymously. Um, if you do it formally, then they're, they're, the Railroad Commission is going to follow up with you as they do the investigation. If you do it anonymously, then they're still going to do the investigation, but they're not going to follow up with you. Um, typically, you'll find that the agency is going to respond in, within 24 hours. What that response looks like is going to depend on how serious the issue is. Um, you know, if you're just reporting that, hey, they don't have a sign that they're supposed to have up at their site, you know, you may not hear over the weekend, but, you know, during next business hours or something to that effect. Whereas if, you know, it, depending on how severe it is, you may get a phone call within 24 hours or there may be an investigator on site within 24 hours. But they will launch, launch an investigation. If they do find a violation, then they will um, issue a notice of violation in order to bring the, the operator into compliance. And um, if the operator the option to 
sever a lease. And that once they issue a notice, I'm, I've been told by Railroad Commission staff, once they issue a notice of a warning that they're gonna to that they're gonna sever a lease, usually that always gets people moving because it's not just that one well that they're gonna shut down, but it's every single well that's on that lease. Um, so they find they I'm told that they find that to be a, an effective tool to bring uh, operators into compliance. So what can the TCEQ respond to? Well, um, they can respond to air quality issues. So if you see or smell something that doesn't seem right and you think it's coming from the wall or gas site, that's something you can, you can report to the TCEQ. Uh, they also oversee public water quality, um, public health problems, or if you, see, uh, if you have excessive dust coming off of a well site. If it's coming off of a truck that's going down the highway, that's not something they deal with, but if it's actually coming off an oil or gas well site, then that is something that you can report to the TCEQ. So a lot of people see flares burning out here, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about what an efficient burning flare is. And this is, this is a picture of an, uh, an efficient burning flare. Um, it's, you can really see the flames. They're marbled, mostly orange, but it has a few dark areas. And you see those few dark areas because it's at this, the, what's called the incipient smoke point. It's just starting to form smoke. So that right there is an ideal burning flare. You don't want, you don't want it to be a clearer flame than that because it's not all, not all the, the gases are burning, but you don't want more smoke than that because then you have pollutants that are being formed from the combustion process. So here's an image of a flare with too much smoke. You see a lot more dark areas there, and you do see a smoke trail, which you shouldn't see. Um, so flares can smoke a little bit, but if it smokes for more than five minutes in a two hour period, then that's out of compliance. And that is something that you would want to report to the TCEQ because there's gonna be, there's gonna be a excessive pollutants coming there from an inefficient burning flare. So what is a five minute period in two hours? That could be over five minutes straight at any given time, or it could be two and a half minutes in this, you know, in this hour and more than two and a half minutes in the next hour. So any, or it could be one minute in this half hour, one minute in the next half hour, and three minutes in the next hour. Anything that adds up to over a total of five minutes in a two hour period, if you go out there with a stopwatch, that's out of compliance and that's something that you would want to, to report to the TCEQ. So if you do report an issue, uh, what does that process look like? Again, with the TCEQ, just like the Railroad Commission, you can do a formal complaint where you use your name or you can do an anonymous complaint. Um, either way, they're going to launch an investigation, but if it's anonymous, they're not going to follow up with you and let you know what the results of that were. Um, they also are going to respond within 24 hours. Um, that again is going, what that response looks like is going to depend on how severe the issue is um, or the, how severe the perceived issue is. So it could be an email, it could be a phone call, it could be an investigator on site uh, within that amount of time. Um, they will launch an investigation and um, if they do find a, uh, a violation, they will try to bring the, the operator into compliance um, and if they have to, if with a, after a, a warning to bring the or a notice of violation, if the operator does not come into compliance, then they can issue an enforcement order. So, uh, when a when a TCEQ investigator goes to the site, um, they're going to collect evidence of uh, whatever the issue is that was reported, and um, that may be photographs. That could be an odor log. Um, these are things that could be help, are helpful in the investigation process that you could contribute um, to let them know what you think the issue is. Um, you can photograph the smoking flare, you can videotape the smoking flare and show that it's, it's smoking for over five minutes. Um, there's also an odor log which I'm going to show you in just a moment that you can fill out and you can tell them what is it, what is it that you're smelling, well, what direction is the wind blowing, where are you oriented in comparison to the site. But if you provide that information, that's something that the TCEQ could use to help them determine what the issue may be, but they're not going to use it as part of the enforcement process. So they're not going to use it as evidence to um, against the, the operator. 
Now this here is the order lock I was talking about. You can see it has it has two things about weather conditions, time, day, um, who is a person that's that taking information down. There's one of those in your folder that's fairly self-explanatory, uh, but the more information you can provide them with, the better off the investigator is. For instance, the time of day that you are um, smelling this odor could be really key. There are some things that you may only smell early in the morning and you know when, when there's less wind. And so if that's the case, and the, if, if you don't provide that information to the investigator, they may show up in the afternoon and say, oh, well, I don't smell anything. So they, this is something that could help them to troubleshoot the issue. Uh, so one of the thing that one thing that we want to encourage you to do is to know your surroundings. So an issue may arise in the future, um, and it's better off if you already know your surroundings if you're already prepared. So if you start smelling something coming from an oil and gas site that could be a potential hazard, that's not a time that you necessarily want to approach the source, right? Because then you're getting closer, you're going to you're you're going to be exposed to higher concentrations of whatever it is. So it's good if you live next to a site or if you work next to a site to go there now and collect information about that site and just keep a copy of that information in your car, keep a copy of that information in your house. You know, you're gonna to wanna to know what the street address is. Um, often the latitude and longitude is gonna be posted there at the site. Uh, what's, what's the name of the site, the permit ID. Um, any kind of landmarks that might help somebody who's not from this area you know, tell them, hey, you know, it's so-and-so's, you know, um, taco shop or whatever, that's where you turn left or anything like that. Any information like that could help somebody. So here's an example of why you would maybe want to collect the information ahead of time. Imagine it's, this is the middle of the night and you smell something and you want to go collect information. Try finding that sign, you know, when it's dark out. Um, so it's just another example of why you might want to go and collect information ahead of time. So um, when you want to report an issue to the TCEQ, uh, we here in Cuddy Springs are in Region 16. That means your local office is Laredo office. Uh, so there's your um, there there the there is the uh, contact information, and you're also going to find the contact information in your folder. So then, what about local law enforcement? Like I mentioned before, TCEQ handles dust if it's coming from the oil and gas site only, right? So if it's a truck, it could be an oil and gas vehicle that's going down the highway, and if there's excessive dust coming off of that, well, that's something you report to local law enforcement. Any excessive noise, excessive traffic issues, light pollution, those are things that you would report to local law enforcement. In addition, uh, if you're reporting something to a state agency, you might also consider reporting it to the local law enforcement. Um, if an issue arises, often, um, you know, you saw that slide where it's over 850 active wells per railroad commission um, in investigator, and uh, there's over 1,000 active wells per TCQ investigator. So often, if you call local law enforcement as well, they can often arrive at the, at the site sooner. Um, they can provide you with documentation by a government entity so they can document it and it, it, that, could provo that documentation could, pro could provide the state agencies with a second opinion of whatever the alleged contamination is. So then they can say, yes, you know, I'm a law enforcement officer, I was on this site when the local resident was, I smelled what, you know, the same thing that they were smelling, I believe it was coming from this direction, any of that, was, that just might help um, with the state agencies. So uh, I'm ready to open up to questions. Anybody might have. Shoot. Well, I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, let me let me give you the microphone. So again, my name is Peter Bella. I. Uh, Saw on your slide when you're going through different colors. Oh, what? It's only one at a time. Is that? Maybe I turn mine off. Okay, there we go. I'm back. I'm back. I'll turn mine off when you answer. Um, there were the different colors: the white, yellow, blue, uh, red. Different colored flags. Is that an indicator of 
the known contaminants in the gas that is in that area at that well site, or is that supposed to indicate that there is known leakage and dangerous gas toxics in the air at that point? Hello. Okay. Um, my understanding is that it that is the that 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 indicates the presence the the level the concentration levels presence of hydrogen sulfide at that site. Not, but it's not necessarily leaking. It's just the pr presence the in that area. Risk. The potential risk is there for that. Like red is the highest, and that's the concentration at that facility. But it's not necessarily leaked. But that is the potential of that level of HQS at that particular well site. And, and just to clarify also, in case anybody lives near the site with the green flag that I used an image of, that wasn't actually a green site flag, a, a, a site with a green flag. I photoshopped that one because I didn't have an image with a green flag. So don't, don't think, oh, there's a presence of hydrogen sulfide there if you live next to it. I, need, I still need an image with a green flag. Maybe Omar can help me with that. Okay, sure. And just to clarify, Peter, the, um, that hydrogen sulfide The flags are based on a concentration of hydrogen sulfide that's measured on, like, from the wellhead right there on the site. So it's based on a measurement that's taken right there. Just you know. And are, the, are, are those indications uniquely for hydrogen sulfide, or are those same indicators? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So is hydrogen sulfide the only common air contaminant that is that toxic that is associated with natural gas production? Well, the, that is currently regulated from the standpoint of, hey, this could cause an immediate mortality. Well, okay, so it's regulated from the standpoint of acknowledging that, yeah, hydrogen sulfide, if it's present in high enough concentrations, can cause an immediate fatality. But there has been at least one case of VOC inhalation by a worker causing a, a pretty immediate fatality. And so, Although that's pretty well, Based on my meetings with TCQ and Railroad Commission staff, the hydrogen sulfide um, appeared to be the contaminant that they consider to be the biggest threat or the, to pose the largest, the most serious hazard. I'm, I'm getting a nod over there from a former Railroad Commission staffer. Any other questions? Sorry. And then there was a whole list of, of uh, potential health risks associated with exposure for a different, uh, several different sets of other gases. Can you speak a little bit to, clearly if hydrogen sulfide is a very high toxicity, which only requires a short exposure for toxic effects to perhaps appear. When you speak in terms of some of those other contaminants, I'm thinking of the people here, if they're living near them, if there are lower levels, while there may not be a flag to indicate the presence of these other contaminants, what kind of exposure rates or periods of time are required is there any way, I mean, I know that you're talking about so many, 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 many chemicals that it's pretty tough to put a, a stamp on it. You see, I'm trying to go, I'm trying to say what kind of health risks are associated with those for people living nearby. It's, there's just, there's so many um, pollutants and there's so many factors that go into it and that it's, it's, it's basically beyond the scope, I think, of this presentation. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would, to get into those details. The only thing I would add to that is that you know there are concentration levels out there where we would know that there's an immediate concern, but what we don't know are the longitudinal health effects of people living nearby these facilities and the long-term exposure to small concentrations of, from well sites. And 
you know, all that depends on how far you live from the well site, um, how often you're around them in your daily work life. Um, there's just so many factors that can contribute. And then isolating that oil and gas exposure from other chemicals that you're exposed to in your life and the health impacts that those could cause can be difficult. And so that might be a reason why there aren't a whole lot of health studies on that. More questions? Don't be shy. All right, thank you very much.